I want to express my gratitude again for the opportunity to give the future lectures. I'm deeply grateful uh, for the hospitality of Dean Sterling and Professor Danielle McRae and um, Caroline Sharp. Also, you know, some students and the staff and the alums. Well, uh, during my stay at Yale Divinity School, I really uh, enjoyed uh, my time here uh, with your kindness and um, with your concerns. Thank you. Thank you. In this last lecture, <clears throat> I will explore the post-colonial imagination and its role in preaching. And I will present Jesus as a post-colonial song by reading the story of Mary's pregnancy uh, through a post-colonial imagination. First, a question. What does the word imagination mean to you? It is a word that has been defined from multiple perspectives over time and is often used to describe the process behind artistic creativity, fantasy, scientific discovery, and invention. In other words, people tend to understand the imagination as the image-making power of the mind, or that which lies behind the act of creating or producing something serious, uh, previously perceived. However, this understanding has been criticized uh, for representing 19th century romantic views of art and imagination in opposition to reason. In his book, The Body in the Mind, Professor Mark Johnson argues that imagination is not separate from reason because it is our capacity to organize mental representations, especially precepts, images, and image schemata into meaningful, coherent unities. The theologian Patrick Sherry helps us understand imagination more comprehensively, writing in his book Spirit and Beauty that imagination involves not only the reasoning part of the mind, but is the whole mind working in a certain way, involving perception, feeling, and reasoning. Thus, imagination is an act, active power, combining ideas and creating something new by mediating memories and present experiences with future action events and hope. It is one of the most advanced human faculties involved in various types of spirituality. It is noteworthy that our imagination depends on our partial memories and fragmentary experiences and are confined to our limited life situations. Just as our memories and experiences are partial and fragmented, so too our imagination. Therefore, if we seek the wholeness of the truth through imagination, we must stretch our imaginations by sharing the memories and the experiences of others. Imagination shared with others makes it possible for us to come closer 
to the holies of the truth. The post-colonial imagination is a shared imagination. And it is shared especially with the colonized of both past and present. In post-colonial imagination and feminist theology, Kwak Pilan explains the shared nature of post-colonial imagination in three modes, historical, dialogical, and dias uh, diasporic. The historical imagination is a practical wisdom born out of the experience of the enslaved and colonized women of the past and present. Their voices and their unwanted stories in the history of Western colonization can be retrieved as part of the process of imagining a new world. By dialogical imagination, Quark means a deliberate strategy for reading biblical texts through dialogue with non-Western myths, stories, and religious resources in a deepened engagement with post-colonial theories and cultural studies. When she discusses the diasporic uh, imagination, Quark understands the meaning of diaspora in a general sense to include all those who have migrated from formerly colonized countries to the metropolitan West for various reasons and in many situations. She explains that diasporic imagination based on their diverse lived experiences help us see our world through their eyes and hence decenter the central, the cultural norms of Eurocentric Christianity. The post-colonial imagination is a medium to connect the preacher and the listeners with those of diverse experiences across racial, ethnic, gender, and class lines, and help them see things from an unfamiliar point of view and discover empathy toward those other people in solidarity with them. Furthermore, a post-colonial imagination is a spiritual channel that connects the divine spirit with the human spirit. Like the Mobius strip, where the two ends of the paper are attached with a half twist and they become one surface, the divine spirit is infused into the human spirit to become one. In the process of imagination, the Holy Spirit vitalizes and liberates the human spirit. And the human spirit is inspired to create something new, new images, new patterns of meaning that are different from those of the colonial imagination. The post-colonial imagination is therefore a divine gift, the God power in the soul as Henry Ward Beecher defines imagination in his Yale lectures in 1873. It is noteworthy that in her essay, Ungrounded Innocence, the feminist scholar Karen Bray criticizes that American Protestant Christianity founded on the ground of European-American Puritan culture has legitimized white supremacy as divinely ordained and whiteness as cherished property. And this colonial imagination has evolved into a myth through Christian preaching, liturgy, and ritual. She urges that this 
diseased imagination needs to be replaced with a post-colonial imagination by actively dismantling structures that have sheltered all white Christians for far too long. How then does the post-colonial imagination make a difference in preaching Jesus? Post-colonial preaching is a imaginative act for the purpose of meaning making in various forms of colonial contexts. It proves existential, theological, and ethical questions such as what does it mean to be human? Where is God and what God is doing to make and to keep human life human? Or what kind of a world do we want to bequeath to the next generations? A post-colonial imagination makes it possible for preachers to respond to these questions by providing new images, metaphors, and symbols of Jesus Christ based on the colonized people's personal and communal experiences and collective memories and help listeners reconsider their identity reflexively. In addition to new images of Jesus as a post-colonial self and a post-colonial child that I presented in my previous lectures, another image of Jesus is a post-colonial song. This image comes from reading Luke's account of Mary's pregnancy through a post-colonial imagination. In Luke, the story of Mary's pregnancy immediately follows Elizabeth's praise to God for her own mirac miraculous pregnancy in chapter 1, verse 25, in which she proclaims, the Lord has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Mary's song is then made up of three vignettes. In verses 26 to 38, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary and announces Mary's pregnancy by the intervention of the Holy Spirit. From verse 39 to 45, Mary visits Elizabeth and is convinced that his pregnancy indicates God's favor. From verse 46 to 55, Mary responds to God by singing a song, the Magnificat. And verse 57 concludes the story, saying that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months. Reading this story through a post-colonial imagination requires a dual vision from the preacher, one for the world in the text and one for the world in the context for preaching. For such a reading strategy, the practical theologian Richard Osmer's four tasks of interpretation are helpful. In his book, Practical Theology on Introduction, Osmer identifies the first task as descriptive and empirical, focusing on the question, what is going on? The second task is the scientific explanation of why this is going on. <laughs> the third task is the normative interpretation of what ought to be going on. <laughs> and the last task is the pragmatic answer to the question, how might we respond? Quote. Osmo suggests this fourfold process of interpretation as a reflective practical theological method. And it is a useful hermeneutical tool 
for reading the biblical story through a post-colonial imagination for preaching. In the story, there are two female characters, Mary and Elizabeth. While the traditional reading of the story focuses on Mary as the main character and regards Elizabeth in a supporting role, both are equally important in a post-colonial imagination for their experiences illustrate the condition of women in a patriarchal colonial culture. These two women are cousin sisters with a wide age gap, perhaps of at least one generation. Yet, their strenuous search to understand their unusual pregnancies leads them to sisterhood in the spirit. And Luke presents their sisterhood as the overture of the good news of Jesus Christ in his gospel. What then is going on with these two women in the story? And why is it going on? I can picture Elizabeth's life through the bifocal lens of a post-colonial imagination. In the first century Jewish patriarchal society, women were valued for their reproductive ability, and especially for giving birth to sons. Many women around the globe are still suffering in such patriarchal cultures where they are treated as instruments of reproduction. I can imagine how excited Elizabeth was about her pregnancy, probably already in her menopausal years. Yeah. However, I can also imagine how difficult and complicated pregnancy might have been in her old age. Yet, Luke is silent about that. As a male, he may have been ignorant about women's experience of pregnancy or didn't consider it important. Mary's pregnancy story is very different from Elizabeth. According to Luke, Mary is a virgin betrothed to Joseph and living in Nazareth, a small, impoverished uh, peasant town in Galilee. Then God sends the angel Gabriel to tell her that the Holy Spirit will be over her, and then she will bear a son, the son of the Most High. In traditional Christian theology, this announcement is the very core of the doctrine of incarnation and a source of belief in the divine, the divinity of Jesus Christ. However, historical critical research and the investigation of feminist theologians lead us to suspect Luke's romantic description of Mary's pregnancy. For example, in her book, The Illegitimacy of Jesus, Jane Sharberg imagines the plausible possibility that Mary might have been raped, either by a countryman or a Roman soldier. In other words, this young teenage girl might have been a victim of sexual violence. Although this claim is debatable, there is no doubt that such an interpretation is possible in light of the historical, social, cultural, and political context of the story. It is possible Mary was a double victim, a victim of the violence of a Roman colonial imperialism, 
and also of the patriarchal Jewish social and legal system. According to historical records, Roman soldiers invaded Galilee and destroyed the town of Nazareth, killing and raping women around the time when Jesus was born. We know that sexual violence is very common during the war, even in our contemporary world. The Gospel of Matthew also records that Mary's pregnancy out of the wedlock placed her in danger of being stoned to death under the Jewish law of adultery. It is for this reason that Joseph, her fiance, wanted to divorce her quietly to protect her from disgrace and the life-threatening danger. While Mary is voiceless in Matthew's account, Luke gives her a voice by telling her pregnancy story not as the story of a victim, but as a story of God's mercy. According to Luke, God is directly involved in Mary's life. God sends the angel Gabriel and her sister Elizabeth at this critical moment in Mary's life and convinces her that God is working through her pregnancy. Perplexed by Gabriel's announcement of her pregnancy, Mary runs to her cousin sister Elizabeth in fear. Elizabeth, who is living in and with the Holy Spirit, quickly recognizes Mary as God does and understands God's grand plan for her with her own embodied joy. Leaping in her womb, Elizabeth prophesies God's promise to Mary and her baby in a loud voice. She is indeed fully human, a spiritual being. She is the partner with God in seeing the world as the Holy Spirit moves. When Mary encounters Elizabeth, the Holy Spirit in Elizabeth moves into Mary's body and soul, and she stands in a third space, a creative holy ground, and imagines a new world, a world in which her powerless colonized people the lowly and poor receive God's mercy. Mary sings what ought to be going on for her people in her song. She first praises God's mercy on her and then proclaims God's victorious deeds for her oppressed fellows. Your mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in their hearts' conceit. You have put down the mighty from their thrones and have lifted up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things, and have sent the rich away empty. The Roman Catholic feminist theologian Elizabeth Johnson declares that this is a revolutionary song of salvation in a concrete social, economic, and political context. People are hungry because of triple X's, taxes, 
being exacted for Rome, the local government, and the temple. The lowly are being crushed because of the mighty on their thrones in Rome and their deputies in the provinces. But in Mary's imagination, a new social order of injustice is at hand with the nearness of the messianic age. And Mary's song praises God for a salvation that involves concrete transformations. Mary, a poor first century Galilean peasant woman living in an occupied territory of the Roman Empire, struggling for survival and dignity, now sings this revolutionary song in the name of God. Although the traditional image of Mary constructed through a colonial imagination is of someone obedient, gentle, and sentimentally dreamy, here she is no longer a voiceless passive victim of the patriarchal colonial power. Here, she is a courageous singer, poet, and a prophetic preacher, dreaming a new world for herself and her children yet to be born. Her notion of what ought to be going on is radical economic reversal and a radical alternative to the oppressive rule of Rome. It is a radical post-colonial imagination, quite unlike the colonial imagination, which is grounded in the insatiable greed of the powerful at the expense of the vulnerable. Native American scholar, Tink Tinker, characterizes the colonial imagination with the term thingification. He explains that the colonizer saw human beings in the territories they colonized as mere objects or things to be used. Africans, Caribbeans, the American Indians, and the like. And all these people are treated by the colonizers' thingifying imaginary. It was never limited to human beings alone, but extends to seeing the whole world as mere things or objects to be dominated by themselves and owned for the enrichment, enjoyment, and comfort for themselves. As a consequence of this colonial imagination, as the Native American feminist scholar Lynn Simpson clarifies, Economic disparity and the destruction of the ecosystem are inevitably interconnected. The destruction of land through resource extraction, environmental contamination, imposed poverty, heteropatriarchy, and colonial gendered violence is the product of the colonial imagination. These Native American voices make us aware that economic justice is deeply connected with cultural and environmental justice. And this worldview and value system leads us to interpret Mary's song as an alternative imagination that is, as a post-colonial imagination that envisions a new world for the whole creation, all human and non-human creatures who have been groaning in labor pains until now. 
Thus, marriage song is a post-colonial song for life, not just human life, but the life of all living creatures with respect for the land, water, and soil. It is not merely about stewardship, but is about partnership with other creatures of earth and a way of living and working that achieves a balance between use and the replenishment of all resources. By singing this song, Mary uproots the colonial imagination and plants the post-colonial imagination. Where is Jesus in Luke's narrative? He is unborn. <laughs> Yet the unborn Jesus is the source of Mary's post-colonial imagination. In other words, the unborn Jesus is a sign of the coming reign of God. And Mary's post-colonial song is a preview of his future ministry. Jesus must have listened to Mary's song from the day of conception through the developmental stages in her womb. Even after, even after he was born, he would have grown up listening to his mother's prophetic revolutionary song again and again. Indeed, he was a preacher's kid. <laughs> Later, Jesus' ministry became a movement of spreading his mother's song that it might come true on the earth. It is thus no wonder that Luke inserts the Isaiah text in Jesus' inaugural address in chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Thus, Mary's song is itself Jesus' identity and a preamble to his ministry. By recognizing the identity of Jesus as a post-colonial song, a sign of the coming reign of God, we recognize our own identity reflexively in a new way and respond to the song by preaching Jesus as our contemporary freedom song. How can we compose our freedom song? In other words, how might we respond Simpson, the Native American feminist theologian, helps us preach the freedom song from a Native American perspective. She says, freedom is a state of the absence of coercion, hierarchy, or authoritarian power of coloniali colonialism. Freedom is connectivity based on the sanctity of the land. Simpson also suggests that to achieve this freedom, the colonizers must stop pondering, plundering the land and the climate and using indigenous people's bodies to fuel their economy. They must find a way of living in the world that is not based on violence and exploitation. 
if we want to create a different future, we need to live a different present. And if we want to live in a different present, we have to allow it to change us. There are many ways to preach marriage song. There are many patterns of preaching, such as the traditional three-point and poem style, verse by verse expository preaching, and the narrative preaching of the new homiletic. I think most of you are familiar with these styles of preaching. While these various preaching styles can be used creatively in a preaching marriage song, I think some literary genres less familiar to preachers can be useful too. For example, writing a community letter is a possible literary method for preaching Jesus as a post-colonial song. This past summer, I had an opportunity to preach a sermon from the story of Mary's pregnancy to a mostly middle and upper middle class European American congregation. To scatter their colonial imagination Consciously or unconscious, unconsciously embedded into their minds. And to plant post-colonial imagination in their hearts, I have had to think a lot what kind of homiletical approach would be effective. And then I thought perhaps dialectical approaches would be good. So I wrote a letter in the movement of the dialectical movement. But this letter is not from me, but this letter to Mary and Elizabeth on behalf of my congregation. The letter began like this. Dear Mary and Elizabeth, Greetings from the United States, <laughs> from a uh, group of church leaders on the other side of the planet 2,000 years after you. The first movement, which is the thesis, is understanding the story by standing in Elizabeth and Mary's shoes in the first century Judean colony of the Roman Empire. And I praised their sister world in the spirit and Mary's courage to sing the revolutionary song. The second movement, the antithesis, uh, is to critically reflect on ourselves as privileged American citizens and negate Mary's song by saying, we are like a new Roman empire, living like Romans. Slavery, exploitation, and appropriation of resources from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. That is the backbone of our nation's wealth, the benefit of a colonialism. We are in no great position to sing marriage song with joy. We dare not praise the God who favors Mary, your own, the colonized, the poor, and the lowly. So 
I said, no, no, no. I'm not qualified to preach the post-colonial song. But this is not only me, all my congregation. The last movement, the synthesis, finds a common concern between the biblical characters and us who seek to bequeath a better world to our children. And we ask Mary and Elizabeth to trans transmit the Holy Spirit to us so that we may also imagine a new world. And in so doing, sing Jesus as a post-colonial song. The sermon concludes like this. Sister Mary and Sister Elizabeth, bless us with the imagination to live as faithful disciples of God in our time of crisis, as fearlessly and compassionately as you. This sermon, uh, in the form of a letter, illustrates that preaching Jesus as a post-colonial song is a prayer, a communal prayer to the Holy Spirit to help us sing a revolutionary freedom song wholeheartedly, not only in words and melody, but in action. Just as Mary sings a vision for a new world on behalf of her children, so do we. In the face that the Holy Spirit is moving ceaselessly to make a difference in God's creation. By preaching Jesus as a post-colonial song, we share the divine pathos and imagination with the world and become prophets of the coming age, just like Mary and Elizabeth. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, it was truly a blessing uh, to me. Uh, it was just over here. My Baptist self was holding, holding back from just shouting um, <laughs> and shouting amen. Uh -huh. um, but I wanted to uh, first ask the question. You mentioned something about you speaking to a congregation, preaching at a congregation, having to implant the post-colonial imagination with that congregation. I would like for you to speak more about that process um, for those of us who are going to be going into congregations who do not hold um, that post-colonial imagination or do not come from that positionality. Um, what, what are some of the things that we can do as preachers and practitioners in um, trying to move the, lead, the needle and, and activate um, our congregations to do this work uh, to have that post-colonial imagination, uh, what can we do to, uh, to get them to hold that viewpoint? What, is, what was that process like for you? Mm -hmm. 
That's a good question. Yeah. I think um, in my lecture, in the first part, I explained uh, what uh, a post-colonial imagination uh, is. And then second part, I interpreted the text you know, uh, through a post-colonial imagination. If I give a lecture on a post-colonial imagination in my sermon, you know, most sermons are lectures, right? <laughs> then uh, my congregation might be sleepy and bored. Uh, okay, okay, I know what you're talking about. However, when I invite the congregation to read the text with me in a different way, and then eventually discover a new image of Jesus, then they're gonna have an aha moment. So if we preach in that way, the congregation might be happy to be challenged. <laughs> and they may want to use their own, uh, their own imagination, which has been contaminated by, post -colonial, uh, by colonial imagination, uh, into transforming into a post-colonial imagination. So the process of imagination is not a kind of a quick one thing. It's an ongoing process, and then feeding our congregations' minds and hearts with fresh new images, yeah, fresh new spiritual food. Good morning, and thank you for making Christmas and Advent easier to preach. I mean, between the insights are wonderful. I'm Patrick O'Connor. I was here 31 years ago. I'm a Presbyterian pastor mm -hmm. in New York City in Jamaica, Queens. In both texts, the Matthew text and the Luke text, Joseph seems to disappear or doesn't fulfill the typical male role. How do you read mm -hmm. the treatment of Joseph in both texts? Yeah. Thank you for the question. In fact, um, Joseph is a mysterious figure in both uh, uh, texts. And um, those Joseph is very generous and pretty active. Uh, in participating in God's salvific plan in Matthew. Not Mary, but Joseph met the angel. And not Mary, but Joseph heard the voice of God in a dream. And he was the one who led his family to the journey of migration to Egypt. It's a wonderful man. He wanted to protect his fiance from you know, the disgrace and the shame. Wonderful picture of a ideal man, I think. You know, um, so perhaps uh, male preachers who want to reinterpret the nature and the role of uh, maleness can this can study this um, Joseph's um, uh, role and then present what shall we do in our post-colonial world to spread the peace and justice. So it is, this is a, um, your role, your responsibility to figure out how we connect this man, the first century colonial world, to the man in the 21st century post-colonial world. So mm. I'm very curious about hearing male preachers' sermons on Joseph. <laughs> Just <laughs> I just thought that was worth noting. Yeah. Uh, Marilyn or Professor, I don't know who is first. Marilyn or Reverend Bobby, you've got the mic and then Marilyn. Thank you.
Thank you so much. It was such a um, um, powerful way of, of, of reimagining. And I guess I wanted to ask you, um, you, you said that this song and this singing was revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering if that is true, do we have to be mindful in daring to sing this song and to preach it? Mm -hmm. that we must pray for an attitude toward preaching mm -hmm. being more than just the congregation being intrigued by our fresh approach to scripture, yeah. but recognizing that it might be dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, it might cause some unnerving. And then secondly, mm -hmm. if what you have taught us this morning might also mean that we as preachers, pastors, cannot leave our choirs and music departments untouched, mm -hmm. that, there may, mm -hmm. that there has to be a kind of theomusicology mm -hmm. so that we're not preaching Mary's yeah. song, but then the choirs are just mm -hmm. singing the songs of the empire, yeah. which is just praising God mm -hmm. without yeah. calling the church to mm -hmm. live out the calling mm -hmm. of God. I want to thank you so much for, for, yeah. for raising that, my, coming from a music family. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, actually, um, one of my suggestions uh, for preaching the marriage song is to compose a music. If um, you are an Episcopalian pastor or preacher, or the Roman Catholic uh, priest to preach, then you have to preach what, seven minute homilies? <laughs> yeah? Then, a song for seven minutes might be very powerful. So you can compose a song or just, you know, words might be enough. As a contemporary uh, liberation song, then uh, that is another idea for homiletical strategy. Uh, first, thank you for this. Uh, all three lectures were so empowering for me as a preacher. Um, <clears throat> but I am curious. You said that the fourth thing is, is our response. And I'm wondering about if you've ever actually preached to a congregation uh, the notion of uh, the possibility that Mary was uh, perhaps raped. Mm-hmm. Um, because I did preach a sermon where I suggested that Abraham going into Haga, Haggai, <laughs> Hag, Hag, Hagar, Hagar, Hagar um, that that was very similar to enslavers in the uh, mm -hmm. antebellum South mm -hmm. uh, impregnating their slaves mm -hmm. for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. And it was not well received. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know what? The marriage song has been banned many times. In the 19th century, uh, during the uh, British uh, colonial era, uh, you know, British, British um, Episcopal Church, Anglican Church, banned uh, the Indian church in India not to sing this song. And then uh, during the 1970s, um, uh, I think the country's name is El Salvador, you know, uh, you know the mothers of the disappeared because the children were disappeared because of the tortures of the um, dictatorship. Then they got together and the sang, and, the, the, and then the authority banned to sing the marriage song um, in public. And then even in Guatemala in 1980s, this song was banned. No one should sing this song. <laughs> and then you courageously sang <laughs> Hagar's song, like a marriage song, you know, in your church. When we do this kind of courageous act, we also need to uh, consider that Perhaps we might be bad to preach <laughs> this kind of song. Yeah. yeah. There, there is a, a text called the Toledo Jesus, which is from, I think, the 10th or 11th century. 
That's good to know that. Mm. Other questions? Here. Thank you. Um, so you you pastor a congregation, is that correct? Or? No, I'm not a pastor, okay. uh, but I'm frequently invited to preach okay. you know, the, to various congregations. Okay, okay. Well, this is, is still a relevant question. Um, so... Mm -hmm. So um, preaching sermons on, on Sundays, uh, even, even a, a colonial imagination, um, usually it doesn't stick with people throughout the week uh, because there's mm -hmm. so much emphasis on, on worship on one day of the mm -hmm. week. How do you, um, how do you, how do you because it, in the, the story of, of Mary, uh, the spirit meets her where she is. She doesn't, she doesn't go to a temple. She's not in a religious place. She's, she's in our home. Uh, or in our cousin's home. So how do you suggest that churches reshape the way in which they uh, worship so that, um, that they are meeting people where they are instead of uh, having people come into a formal uh, worship setting on one day a week? Mm -hmm. And how, does that, how can you further the, the post-colonial imagination through changing the way in which you worship? Mm, okay, thank you for the question. You know, these days, we need to think about preaching in different ways. For example, traditionally, we think preaching should be done behind the pulpit in a huge, uh, beautiful sanctuary. You know. But now we live in a very different context. And then I, th I say our preaching should be more dynamic and more flexible. Because not many people come to church. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, if we think of preaching as a public discourse, then we have lots of resources because preaching has been done in that way. But if we think of preaching even in a private context, there are not many resources. Because private context is a rapport style. Well, is that preaching? Or like that. But I say this is a kind of meta preaching. Meta. It embraces not only traditional, but also something different too in our post Christian era. Preachers th should think that wherever we are, whatever we talk, whoever we talk with, those moments are preaching moments. So when we get together in a house, house church, well, one of the ways to preach or communicate the good news in relation to marriage song is to share the congregation or the gathered people's experiences. So the preacher can say, well, I read this text from this angle, post-colonial angle, but you don't have to mention post-colonial to them. <laughs> and then what is your own experiences? What do you think? So this kind of informal or formal conversations, you know, in a uh, different place from the sanctuary is counted as preaching. And then I also think even online preaching is a sort of a meta preaching style. We never ever thought preaching should be done on the screen, right? So, thank you. So we need to think more about creative approaches to preaching, meta, meta preaching, yeah. We can make one more question, right here. Thank you so much for your mm -hmm. uh, lectures. Uh, some post-colonial thinkers, uh, not in the religious theological realm, but more in the intellectual, political, cultural realm from North Africa and South Asia, who themselves were victims of colonialism and are post-colonial thinkers, often reflected on that it's impossible to be 
uh, to address colonialism in the language of the colonialists, in English or in French, mm -hmm. so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So if you transfer that into your space, I was wondering what should be the role of Christianity in addressing in the post-colonial imagination? If, is that part of the, the problem? Should we, how should we think about Christianity as a colonizing force? And how do you, mm -hmm. should we abandon that language, so to speak? Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned in my lecture um, Kwak Pilan's three modes of post-colonial imagination, historical, dialogical, Dia diasporic? Well, the f first one, the historical imagination, is very related to uh, the Southeast Asia or other colonized countries, Christian believers. We have all the time, I mean, I, as a one of the colonized peoples in Asia, uh, I have been grown up hearing the biblical stories just biblical stories, not our stories. So I have to throw away all my cultural identity and religious identity, and then fill my empty self with the Western understanding of Jesus, white Jesus. So, but historical imagination, as Kwak Pilan said, helps us to understand the Bible from our own experiences. And then also diasporic interpretation is very helpful to bring you know, others' voices to think about the relationship between their voices and my voices. Also, dialogical interpretation you know, is, a challenge, is a challenge for us. For example, um, Kwak Pilan uh, suggested in her book um, we can imagine Jesus as a corn murder from a Native American perspective, or, Shid, or uh, Shatiki is a Native uh, is an Indian Indian understanding of God and woman. So she challenges us to think in different modes of Jesus. Perhaps some people think, well, this is very synchronistic. <laughs> Perhaps so, but for the indigenous people who have had those kind of cultural and religious experiences, those kind of new images of Jesus are really appealing to them. Yeah. Would you join me? Thank all of you for being here, and I'm going to use a Jewish expression, YDS next year. <laughs> it begins with Y, just like Jerusalem. 